Okay, great. Hey, everybody. Good to see everyone. I want you guys to know that if I were to turn the camera around now, there's like a whole audience. About half of the people that spent Shabbat with us are now live at the fellowship. We're in Silt, Colorado. Guys, make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> and so last Shabbat, we were in Iowa and it, to, we've just, we've gone through the mountains, we've gone through the plains, we've gone through the rivers, the cities of Chicago. And uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we've been to the Colorado Rockies before, but never this far into the mountains. And then we got here and as I'm looking around, it's hard to, even I'm looking outside the window that's right here, everything here looks like out of a dream, out of a postcard, out of a movie. It's so beautiful here. And then as we come into the mountains, um, well, it, we, it was like a little bit late. It was like traffic coming up. They bought us kosher meat. We started making a barbecue and then out of nowhere, a torrential storm came. And it was like, wow, how is this happening? As we're like trying to light the barbecue storms, we're holding up tables to try to block the, the rain from hitting the fire. And then lightning is striking and then uh, rainbows appear. And then with the sunset turns into this magical color, purple and orange. And I couldn't help but feel as though the, the, the universe was lighting up. God was like, pay attention. If you think this is just another Shabbat, it's not. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. And it was just like wonder after sign after another. Like it was just the most. And then it just stopped. And then the, it just became beautiful weather. It was just like to enter into Shabbat with such a storm of insanity. And uh, we just had the most amazing Shabbat. Um, with the most wonderful people. I don't know how we've done it, but the fellowship has somehow attracted the most beautiful souls in the world. I can't wait. We have to figure out a way of connecting more people with more people. People came from all over Colorado, three hours, four hours, and they never met each other. And it was just like something magical is happening on these Shabbats, something we've never done before. And it was, um, it was incredible. And um, well, I just, I wanted to share one story that Tehillah actually shared over Shabbat that really touched my heart. And I know that she's not going to talk about it, but I did want to talk about it myself. On Friday morning, uh, we woke up in the morning and I get a message from uh, our friend that's staying in our house on the farm. And he says, your dog Dreidel has been run over by a car and we don't know where he is. And Dreidel has been the bane of my existence for almost 10 years. He is the most useless dog. Um, he's not really housebroken. He's not very intelligent. He bites people sometimes. It's not really a bite because he's so literally like a chihuahua. It doesn't really do anything, but he's not very friendly. Um, but he is my oldest son's like love of his life. And when we heard that he was run over by a car and we'd know where he was, um, I almost started to cry. I was like, what? A dreidel? I mean, when we first moved to the farm, dreidel was our last line of defense. Mm -hmm. All we had, we didn't have any guard dogs. We didn't have any sheep. We just had Dreidel, our chihuahua. He was our guard dog. And we've gone through so much with that dog. And it was like such a horrible way to start Friday. I was like, how am I going to tell Lavi? What is he going to say? He's going to blame us that we left Israel. And why didn't we put him in a better place? And what, oh gosh, well, it's just a terrible morning. And then about an hour and a half later, I get a message from my friend saying, oh, never mind. We found him. He's fine. He wasn't even run over by a car. And I'm like, oh, oh God, what a terrible morning. For what was that for? And then all of a sudden, I was elated, just so happy to be alive. And nothing had changed. Nothing, my life was the same life that it was beforehand. Nothing moved, nothing changed. And just the paradigm shift of what could be and what should be. And just realizing that everything that we have is exactly the way it should be. And we should be so grateful for everything that we have. And then as I really felt the love that I had for this little dog that's really been the bane of my existence, it really helped me understand an insight into Balak, the Torah portion that we learned over Shabbat that I never understood before because the verses that always bothered me were, you know, God comes to Balak and says, well, if men come to summon you, arise and go with them. But only the thing that I shall speak to you, you shall do. Balaam arose in the morning and sat on his she-donkey and went with the officers of Moab. God's wrath flared because he was going. And I'm like, well, well, what does God want here from Balaam? I mean, for years I was reading that and I just never understood. God said, if people come and summon you, go with them. People came, summoned him and he went. And then how is God upset with him? Something else must be going on. And so it really um, struck me that as the donkey pushes him into the corner, boom, out of just absolute rage, as if I just had a sword in my hand, I would just slay you, my donkey. And the donkey's like, but I've been such a loyal donkey for you for so many years. How could you strike me like that? And I was like, well, what we see here is that Balaam's inside was just really rotten. God wasn't um, upset with his lack of obedience. He was following the letter of the law and doing exactly what he was instructed to do. 
but God judges the hearts, not just the actions. And it seems like his actions were totally aligned. Theoretically, he never really did anything against God's will, but um, God's ultimate will is that we have a pure heart, that we have a joyful heart, that we have a place of um, a foundation of love and compassion. And here we see that, you know, his donkey kind of pushing him into a side, the rage and anger that erupted just shows the mental state that he was at. And what I have decided, or we're not decided, just discovered is that there is a common thread between all of the people of the fellowship, whether they're getting married and engaged in Norway, or they're here in the mountains of Colorado, their insides are so pure, their insides are so good. And their outsides may take different forms and different shapes. And some people have this level of observance and some people have this way of living and this way of following their heart, but their hearts are so good. And I think that on the inside, that's really what binds us all together. All these people that are seeking after Hashem with pure hearts, with love and compassion is our foundation. And it has just been um, a pleasure, an honor. It has been amazing. Finally, having a chance to spend Shabbat real time, learning their families, learning their stories, and um, it's just like the flame of the fellowship is growing and growing. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and <clears throat> thank you. We're just so thankful for our gracious hosts here in Silt, Colorado, and get to talk to them, a couple of them, in a few uh, in a few minutes. But um, you know, Ari, you'll appreciate this. I was very lucky this week that uh, you know we found ourselves in at the. Waller base in Patterson, Missouri. And I wake up in a cold sweat at about three in the morning. And I get this bad feeling like there's something Jeremy is not telling me. And I Google distance between Patterson, Missouri and Silt, Colorado. <laughs> this is Wednesday morning, mind you. And it says 18 hours. <laughs> I said, Jeremy, we have to drive 18 hours in three days. He's like, yeah, no big deal. I'm like, thank goodness he pulls the wool over my eyes regularly to take me on these escapades. Because <laughs> if I would have known, I would have said, we can't do that. But Baruch Hashem, Jeremy did the entire drive on his own. And our children were only slightly worse for the wear. And, and we were lucky enough to get all the way out here to Silt just in time to barely get our food in the oven for Shabbat and launch into the most incredible and memorable Shabbat. Um, I was even luckier that on Shabbat afternoon, uh, Jeremy was uh, Jeremy was wiped out, so he went to take a nap, and uh, uh, apparently, not realizing it, I went on a, about a, how, how long was it, guys? About a three-hour ramble, three-hour Torah <laughs> ramble, and so, <laughs> and so uh, you know, we talked about a lot of things, but there's just one idea that came up that I want to share with the whole fellowship, because it came up in our discussion together. Somebody in the group asked me, well, you know, because now we're sort of in the junction between Balak and uh, the portion of Balak and the portion of Pinchas. In you know, in America, we read Balak, in Israel, we read Pinchas. So we're sort of at the junction where this story takes place of Pinchas's zealousness. And so somebody said, "Well, do we need more of the spirit of Pinchas? Like, is this a good thing? What what is that about? Because it seems kind of out of the ordinary." And so it just got me thinking a little bit about this showdown between. Pinchas and Zimri, because Pinchas and Zimri are obviously individual people, but they're also ideas, because Pinchas is the son of the, you know, high priest. He's like the, the, the grandson of Aaron. He is the, you know, idea of the tribe of Levi, and Zimri is the prince of the tribe of Shimon, so he is like representing the idea of the tribe of Shimon, and what a clash they're having, but it's not the first time we meet this pair, right? There's something going on here that's like a multi-generational development. And what is that about? So got me thinking back, like, what is the first time we meet Shimon and Levi? The first time we meet Shimon and Levi is, of course, when they slaughter Shechem, the city of Shechem. And Yaakov is not pleased with them. And what is going on there? There are these, you know, two brothers that they're acting together. What is driving them? And so the Torah is a little bit ambiguous on what's driving them because in the beginning they say you know they sound they sound really like moral they say they were fired deeply with indignation for he had committed an outrage in Israel you know this was such a thing must not be done it was like a moral indignation at what happened to Dina but in the end when Yaakov gets upset with them they say 
is going to turn our sister into a harlot. There's something there that sounds more like Mafia. gang wars. Yeah, like it's not, I'm going to do it in like some sort of Bronx accent, you know? Like there's something going on here that seems a little bit like prideful. Like we're just like going out and vengeful, prideful. It's not really about maintaining the moral status of the you know people of the land, but really something that's like a little bit like tribal, you know, bullying. And well, well, what is it then? What is it? Like, what is driving them? And it's complicated because whenever we do things, what is driving us? Are we, are we being nice to somebody because we care about them? Are we being nice because it makes us feel good to be nice? When we're doing something bad, is it because of, you know, when we're, when we're aggressive, is it because we're fighting for Hashem or is it because we're just aggressive people? How do you know we're so complicated? And so that's the first time that Shimon and Levi appear together, but it's not the only time they appear together because they appear together again in the final portion in Genesis, in Vayechi, where Yaakov is blessing all of his sons. He gives each of his sons an individual blessing, but just two of them, Shimon and Levi, get a blessing together. And what is their blessing? Is it really even a blessing? It's kind of a blessing-ish, curse-ish, where he says, I am going to divide you from one another because your wrath is so powerful. I'm going to divide you from one another, and I'm going to disperse you in Israel. Now, is being divided and dispersed, is that, is that good or bad? Well, it depends how you look at it. And then the third time we meet them together is here in this story. And now look what happens in this story. In this story, well, are Shimon and Levi driven by really caring about the moral level of the nation? Or are they just kind of wrathful, violent people? Well, Pinchas kind of proves where he's coming from. Pinchas uses his wrath, even against his own nation, even against his own people, but to maintain the moral status of Israel. Shimon, who had claimed to be really concerned about the moral status in the Shechem story, the, you know, representative of the idea of Shimon doesn't seem, when the girls of Moab come about, it doesn't seem like he is the, uh, you know, person to be giving moral judgments. And so they, they sort of bring cl clarity to that question of what was driving them. And then look how their blessings come to pass as blessings or curses. Look what happens to Shimon. You never meet anybody from Shimon after this story because Shimon eventually just dissolves kind of into the tribe of Judah and they disappear. But Levi, the same words of Yaakov, the same words come to pass with him in that he's dispersed in the most positive way. He's spread throughout Israel into cities where he can teach his zealousness and be an inspiration to the nation and give that moral compass in each tribe, a little taste of Levi. So that blessing actually becomes a blessing for Levi and a curse for Shimon in a perfect harmony with what's really driving them on the inside. And it teaches us something so deep that our sages conveyed to us that our future actions can actually have the power to even change our past. Because there's this strange saying in the Talmud that when a person repents, their former, their sins from their past become zchuyot, become merits. You say, well, wouldn't it be more normal to say, when you know, when you sin, Hashem, when you when you repent, Hashem forgets about your sins. That would be like, okay, that makes sense. You know, you repented. Let's let's erase all those sins. It says no, Hashem remembers your sins and turns them into merits. What does that mean? That your future actions, your future decisions, are able to reinterpret for yourself and even in Hashem's eyes reinterpret your past and then curses that might have come onto you as a punishment for those sins can actually turn into blessings just like Yaakov's words turned into blessings for Levi but they turned into punishments for Shimon and so I think this you know showdown between these two people give us kind of a taste that we can take into our own lives everyone looks back and has you know regrets and oh if only I could have done that and if only I should have done that but the Torah portion is teaching us that it's never too late because through our future actions we can re not only change our future but redeem the meaning of our past so that was something that came up for us on shabbat that i thought was memorable and i just wanted to share it with the rest of the crew yeah i just wanted to think by the way that was absolutely amazing thank, thank you. you you're wonderful um i just wanted to invite um a couple of people here that are in the audience uh to just share a little bit about shabbat to kind of give people in the fellowship um a taste of the other side here it's like there's like a professional studio but there's a whole community of believers that are here in Colorado that have come together 
and that we had an opportunity to come from the mountains of Judea to the mountains of Colorado to celebrate such a unique Shabbat, like once in a lifetime, once in a, in a century, who knows? But um, it was definitely a first time for me. And maybe, Caleb, do you want to start? Cindy, do you want to come? Can I, can I, well, I guess, can I just show everyone the, the yeah. crew that's here? So, uh, so, Cindy, why don't you come up here? And then, here, let, let Caleb do it. That You don't break anything, Tila. Let, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here, come sit here. Hey, hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Here, Tila, come. Hi. So um, my name is Cindy Apps, and uh, my husband and I and our two sons live here in just outside of Silt uh, in, in a little town called Rifle. Wait one second. Cindy was the mastermind of this Shabbat, <laughs> it should be said, that she organized so many things for us. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's, um, I'm glad that she did not realize how far away they were. So they would actually make the trip. Um, it was, uh, a couple of times my husband and I, we actually stopped and we said, gosh, is he actually not behind a screen? Like he's actually in the room with us. <laughs> like it was just such a gift. Um, I, I, Jeremy asked me just a minute ago to, to talk. And I was thinking, gosh, well, what did I want to say? And I think the thing that um, I wanted to convey was um, there's been two words that have come up for me in various different ways that Hashem is just bringing over and over, and they are alignment and they are connection. So alignment and connection. <laughs> we have desired for so many years now to align ourselves to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have a desire to align ourselves to to oneness, to unity. Um, we've, desi we've desired to align ourselves to the Jewish people. And, you know, we don't have anybody to teach us right here in the ways that we really wish that we could. And this fellowship has been such a gift um, for that. Jeremy and Ari and Tahila um, has just been, they have come forth and wanted to teach us. And to be able to stand there on Shabbat and be able to do our prayers on whatever level we are on, with whatever knowledge we have, and to have Jeremy and Tehillah there and to teach us. And they let us do what we normally do without judgment, but they came in with the wisdom of the Torah and from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they said, let me show you and let me teach you. And what an honor and what a gift. And I hope that you all can experience this too. I know there's something going on in Texas for Shabbat and I hope you guys can all make it. Um, but these people and their heart to teach us has just shown us that it's okay to be who we are, where we are. We don't have to try to be anybody different as long as our hearts are to align with, with God, with Hashem. He's going to send all the people that we need. And so I say that as an encouragement to everybody, because I know there's a lot of you that are alone out there and you're not alone here. And these guys just brought it to a whole new level of real. So thank you for doing that. And, um, um, just one last thing I remember from what Jeremy was saying when he was talking, when we were going through the prayers is he was talking, he started with the Modeani. I mean, you know, I've been familiar with that for a long time, but I think the thing he said, what that impacted me the most was, you know, our natural state is alignment with gratitude, alignment with gratitude. And when we say the Modeani and we align ourselves with gratitude, then our natural, um, desire next is to be indebted and to be in service to Hashem. And I just, um, I was just thinking about how much I want to take that embodiment of alignment and gratitude um, to a whole new level. And um, so thank you, Jeremy. And thank you. Thank you. thank you so much for sharing that. That was really beautiful. Kid, do you want to just say some words? All right, there we are. So we have, we have like a spokesman of the fellowship. Here we oh, are. 
Hey, everybody. I'm super stoked. Um, when Jeremy was, <laughs> it was, it's so funny when you show up, it's like, there's just like this inspiration that hits me. It's like, it, it, I feel like my number one fan slash cheerleader from Israel has just showed up here in Colorado. And like, how many of us need like a, like a coach that's just like ecstatic about what we're doing. And I think Jeremy truly embodies what I believe the nation of Israel will become as they, as they, I would say evolve, but as they grow into the destiny that Hashem has for them. And that is that the nation of Israel is going to say, wait a second, we're supposed to be those coaches to the world that are going to just say, guys, listen, you're doing great. And so when I landed out here in Silk, Colorado and bought the resort, Jeremy was like, Caleb, there's a lighthouse. There's a, there's a, you know, I've got an Israeli flag out here. And I feel like that little pole that goes up is like my antenna that's connecting me to Jerusalem. And so that's, that's like my, my daily pulse. When I look out my door and I see our Israeli flag, it's like, guys, we are anchored here in Silk, Colorado, but connected to the life stream that's coming from the land of Israel on a weekly basis through the land of Israel fellowship. And I know a lot of you guys feel that way. And uh, I'm super, super, super stoked. Like, so what's happened over the weekend? It's been a whirlwind, to be honest with you. It's been like, it's just, there's so much to process right now. I, I have to say, it's just been, you know, Israel has been very near and dear to Ken and I's hearts for a long time. And it was the center of everything we did for 14 years. And to, to step back here into Silk, Colorado, and then just say, okay, what are we doing here? Like how, what, what's happening? And we, and as Jeremy and Tila had been here, Ken and I were just, you know, laying in bed talking last night. And we're just like, is is the connection like being reestablished? Is something happening? And so I, I, I want to tell you guys on the fellowship here. I mean, my, we're already setting a date for next year for all of you guys to put on your calendars. Cause we're going to bring in the whole crew, not just Jeremy and Tila. We're going to bring in, you know, Ari and his family, hopefully. And we're going to do a Shabbat like no other right here on the resort. And so I told Jeremy, cause Jeremy called me last month and he was like, Hey, we're coming to Colorado. Let's get it done. I'm like, do you realize my resort books like six months to a year in advance? Like we, we, we need to nail down a day. So if you guys are interested, we'd love to have you come to Western Slope of Colorado, be hosted by our wonderful fellowship and friends that are here uh, and just experience a Shabbat like no other. Cause you know, unfortunately not all of us are able to make it to Israel often, but uh, maybe we can bring these guys here to us. And that's what we've experienced uh, this weekend. And it's been super, super, super blessed. And so in saying all of that, Yishar Koak. Go in strength, my brother. Thank you. Thank Shalom. you. Caleb. All right, Ari. So we'll pass it back to you now. Thank you so much. We miss you guys and um, bringing the light of Judea to Colorado. It's pretty amazing. Hi, my name is Jeremy Gimpel. A lot of people want to know exactly what the Land of Israel Fellowship is and what members receive when they join. So let me explain. The Land of Israel Fellowship is a global online community with hundreds of members from over 40 countries around the world. Their live sessions and gatherings that create a direct personal connection to the land of Israel and to lovers of Israel from around the world. There's no online gathering that I'm familiar with that is connected to the land of Israel that unites and brings together such a diverse group of people, backgrounds and nationalities. It feels like prophecy. It feels like something we need in these times, like a window in to a better future on the horizon. There's a divine unity we experience every week in our fellowship broadcast. We heard these amazing teachings from an authentic Hebrew and Israel perspective and our jaws drop. Not only because they ring so true and are such a blessing, because they are so consistent with what we believe. These Sunday morning gatherings are nothing less than a house of prayer for all nations. Cindy Lowe, the United States of America. The Land of Israel Fellowship is an amazing resource for learning Torah, the Bible, and the prophets unfiltered and uncentered directly from the land of Israel. We've been studying Torah for almost 20 years, but we feel we are stepping into it more than ever and seeing new depth and dimensions to scripture. We're encouraged more and more every week. Callan Ardell, USA. Members receive access to all the archives in the library of teachings on every portion of the Torah, the biblical feasts, Hebrew prayer, prophecy, sessions on the ancient wisdom of the prophets of Israel, to help us navigate through these turbulent times. These sessions are so rich. I re-listen to each, and truly each session is the best one yet. Tehila is a tremendous asset and the teachings Ari shares are so rich. I've read the Bible so many times and I've known the things you are teaching. The Hebrew understanding is what Christians have missed for centuries. Sister Georgian from Germany. The Land of Israel Fellowship is truly unique because it's built upon personal relationships with the teachers of the fellowship, myself, Rabbi Ari Abramowitz in Tehillah Gimpel. Every member has direct access to the staff 24 six via email or direct WhatsApp to ask questions, to comment, to connect directly to all the teachers. And over the last years, we've connected to some of the most beautiful people on the planet. 
So if you want to find out more and join the Land of Israel Fellowship, you can click on the link below. And if you want to try it out for just a month, you can email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com and we'll hook you up. I hope to see you. Shalom from the mountains of Judea.